Do you get stumped whenever you try to time the market? Do you want to know how to inside trade legally? In today's Wall Street Wildlife episode, we're going to cover those topics and more. Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. Badger, do you want to talk about the serious ass whooping I'm getting in the market right now? Christoph, timing the market is hard. And my friend, you have tried to time the market. It hasn't gone so well so far, has it? It has gone terribly. I feel awful. And what's terrible is that, you know, after all these years not doing it, I decided to basically uh, abandon my most fundamental principles and, yeah, and engage in market timing. How, we, how are we defining that? How do you define that? Let's unpack what timing the market actually means. Like at the most basic level, if I think my stocks are going to go down in value and I have absolute courage of my convictions, the rational thing to do is to sell everything, wait for them to go down and then buy them all back again, assuming I still like those companies. That's what timing the market is. And everybody thinks they're smarter than the market and they think they can do that. You know, even I suffer from this delusion, but it can often come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah. So I sold most of my positions and the ones that I kept were small cap companies. And to be clear, this is in your real, real personal money portfolio and in some elements of your King of the Jungle challenge, which we'll talk about in the next topic. Correct. That's right. And so in hindsight, this was a major error because I, I basically took this approach around October, November. And if you remember, even those few months ago, things were looking very, very grim, very grim. And so I'm trying to think through why I thought this time, as opposed to all the other years and years and years of, of resisting that urge, I, I decided to take this approach. And I think for me, it's actually twofold. It was a, it was a sequence of bad events for me personally. The first, for all our listeners, the, uh, <clears throat> you may recall that I over allocated to a company that I knew a lot about and that backfired for now. I mean, not for now. Uh, it backfired spectacularly. It was just, uh, I suppose, a painful experience, which I think colored my psychology. And so I was maybe more in a conserve, okay, conserve what I have left mentality. So the first big mistake for me was risk al a pr an issue of risk allocation too much on a, on a, on a bet that was too risky, major, major boneheaded error. I mean, there's no other way, there's no real other way of uh, stating this, uh, in terms of principles, I will put it squarely in the camp that when you think, you know, too much, it gives you false confidence because you never know, you can never know. Yeah, and you're, you know, I do remember these conversations we were having through the back half of last year. Um, you know, clearly you were being led, as we all are, by your emotions, but maybe they drove you to make bigger magnitude decisions than may have been wise. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder, Badger, to what extent was emotions versus intellect? I mean, I it's both. It's not one or the other. I mean, the one emotion I'll name is greed. I mean, as an emotion or maybe uh, not a good one of the most deleterious qualities humans possess in the desire to become financially independent or wealthy. You want to do it quicker than than is usually possible. That led me so that uh, risk management flop led me to lose a lot of capital, which then put me in a more conservative mindset. At that time, then I'm thinking of now needing to conserve and everything I started reading about macro conditions, which I don't think I'm wrong about, by the way, I'm still, I mean, I wonder if this is the same error now happening the se second time, where from my limited yet fairly diligent perspective, 
the more I learn about the large global economic picture, the more uncertain and doubtful I am. And so that, that confluence, I would say, made me more or less sell out of the market. And what, what happened immediately after I did that? The market essentially went straight up. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't have timed, I couldn't have timed this decision more disastrously. Those of us who are invested, thank you for your service. <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I do what I can. But there's a yeah, there's a there there's still a, a a question for me, or I guess should there, there's a question for all investors because now, uh, because I still hold the macro views that I hold, to buy back in now seems. I just can't. I, in other words, it would be an example of of selling low, and buying high. And kids, this is exactly why timing the market doesn't work. Because as Christoph has now brought to life, just, you know, as thousands of investors have experienced countless times in the past, once you, in this case, once you get out of a position, like, how do you get back into it? Because it's like, oh, I just missed the bus. Now I've got to wait for the next bus. Like I have so much sunk cost in this decision I've taken that I've committed to. Uh, I've just got to be right now. I've got to hang on until I'm right. Like, who knows? No one knows where the market's going to go in the next six months. And the problem is, as you've said wisely in our No Limit podcast a year ago, it's not enough to be right. Like you have to be right and your timing has to be right. Like there will be a recession at some point, you know, there will be a market crash at some point, but maybe we've got another 20, 30 plus percent upside before we see that occur. And that's more upside that you miss out on if you're not participating. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> I think, you know, in hindsight, God, everything is so obvious. So that, that's, that's the trouble. I'm trying to still figure out why this was the time. I, you know, yet again, I'm going to return to that question. Why did I do this now, but never before? And I think part of it really has to do with the extent to which I'm generally scared that we're looking at a repeat of 2008, but worse. Let's not go back down that rabbit hole. Like if you want to understand and unpack the arguments, go listen to our episodes 10 and 11 with our guest, uh, Mr. Nod Advice, and we get into his, in some depth, his seven visions of how the world could uh, doom itself, either financially or in a kind of fiery chaos um so let's be a bit more optimistic in this episode uh, but uh, yeah go on finish that thought yeah uh okay so to keep it simple the reason i did it was because i got scared and wanted to conserve i also thought that the the money market rate right now that i'm getting on robin hood is five percent Great point. So, yeah. in terms of cash management, um, I thought to myself, okay, I see the world pretty grimly, and the cash will be making me 5%. And when the inevitable correction happens, uh, I'll use that cash pile and, and get in. But that's exactly what market timing is. And yeah. You know, as I'm sitting here over the last couple of weeks, I've been so envious right now of your, you know, of your position because you took the simple route in a sense and hindsight shows you've been right now. So I, far. Right. See, that's the interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> if we could talk about, you know, it, also, by the way, it's terrible, terrible to now be psychologically motivated to want the market to go down. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the yeah. way, like small point, FYI, now wearing a bear outfit, it's not just <laughs> right. It's not. It, it, it's it's not a good feeling. Yeah, because it creates. Course, uh, I don't, I yeah, don't yeah, want the world it. to go it's, to explode. Yeah, and we also, you know, we are both uh, by profession seven investing lead advisors, and we have a whole community of people and subscribers there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's our job to identify the world's best companies and 
you know, explain why we think that they have market beating potential. So it's hard to do that and have this cognitive dissonance with your view that everything is screwed at the same time. Well, let me, uh, hmm. let me massage that a little bit. This gets into the tricky, how about that? How about this? Forget the doomsday stuff. What if I say that right now, I think things are just way overvalued, removed from that the fundamental, what, what do we mean by that? That the fundamentals of the company, how much a company is making and the price that the market is willing to pay for a certain amount of dollars that company makes there are these periods as markets go up and down where we say the valuations become stretched, meaning the market is now willing to pay more and more and more for the same dollar. One option is to not do much. You just wait for the valuations to extend and compress. That's your route. Correct? Buy the best quality companies, try and ignore what's happening over the couple of year time frame. focus on the long goal. Yep. Right. But it, instead of, say, selling, do you think it's market timing to say the valuations right now are really stretched, therefore I'm not going to add? For many companies they are, but not for every company. Um, let's pick the Magnificent Seven. I think Google, amongst that elite grouping, is actually fairly undervalued. Um, but I think uh, NVIDIA is pretty overvalued. But doesn't mean Nvidia can't keep going up. Let me, uh, you're, you're staring into the abyss. <laughs> let me, uh, let me remind you of how I've played this and how this, the approach I've learned to live with. And then, uh, and it's it's essentially what you're doing, but in much more moderation. Like I think I, I think I sent a message on Slack to you the other day to say, um, like you've you've essentially taken like an all-in bet. And you've committed yourself to a certain course of action. Now, when you shared Mr. Nod Advice's seven dooms, like num a number of them made sense to me. And I agree with the thesis, but I know I can't predict the timing mm -hmm. or the magnitude. But what I did do was I increased my cash position from 14% to, I think, 21%. And my thinking there was, if the market does take a downturn, then at least that 21% is going to grow. In, or you know, be protected. Yeah. And if the market keeps going up, I'm like 79% invested, so I'm going to get like a good chunk of that benefit. So I've taken I've done the same thing as you, at the same time essentially, but I've taken a much smaller uh, commitment to that. So I kind of get upside and downside, whichever way things go. And I think that is the more sensible course of action for multiple reasons, but perhaps primarily to help you manage your own emotions. Because you're, you're, at least you're going to have some element of something to celebrate, whether things go up or down. You know, in full disclosure, because this gets maybe a little lost in our king of portfolio jungle, because we're only talking about equities, but, but the second half of my strategy was to keep two of my major crypto allocations. And this is where your our paths diverge a little bit, Badger, because... I believe in the crypto. I believe in crypto as an investment asset class, at least only the top three. Meaning, I don't believe in the shit coins. I, I don't play with that stuff. And by top three, I'm talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Chainlink. And so I, I, I essentially shifted my money into Chainlink and Bitcoin, which I think, from principle standpoint makes sense. I don't think there's any dissonance there. I simply thought to myself, equities are being overvalued. What Bitcoin and Chainlink represent are an alternate system that makes more sense to me. It's an industry that is uh, young and growing, hiring the most developers, so forth. So from an investment standpoint, I think I essentially switched asset types, but I didn't just go all in into cash. 
So in other words, I'm going to, in as much as all the systems are tied together, if liquidity, if, if the world does not go to hell in the handbasket, I will continue the profit via Chainlink and Bitcoin. So principle, principle wise, you know, I just really, I wanted to almost like enter a confession booth, <laughs> you know, and say, uh, from when we started this podcast, Badger, I took a, a path that was new to me and up to, up to now that path has led to me violating some of the principles upon which all of my investing philosophies lay. In other words, all of the things I knew, I took this left turn because I thought I knew better and the market has proven me up to now completely wrong. So let's land the plane to use your parlance. So uh, how you, what, what are you going to do now, having identified this? And what lesson have you learned for the future that a listener, if they're in a similar mindset, can apply? I wish this was a simple question or answer to give you. Because I want to say, I guess the the period of this uh, of of this phase of my investing career, I'm just counting it on my hands. Like it's 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 what October, November, December, January. It's like only been four months. What happens if? I mean, this is a little theoretical, but what happens if a month from now the market does drop severely? Because I'll profit from it because I, I'm set up to with a bunch of puts. Now I'll be making money the other way. Will that be enough to correct, to, 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 to say this, this in the moment feeling of having been wrong, will that be enough to say, no, you weren't wrong. It's just your thesis didn't have enough time to play out. Or am I actually wrong de facto right now? There's no way of knowing, right? There's no way of knowing. Cause you're, you're, you're in, I sense you're in danger of making the same mistake again. You right. No, like you've missed the bus. And it was four, you've been now waiting at the bus stop for four months. And you're like, well, the other bus is going to come soon, but maybe it's going to be another four months before the next bus comes. Who knows? No one knows. Why not get back in partially? Like everything you've done up to now is sunk cost and irrelevant. Like you've just flipped the coin. And it's come down yeah. heads like 12 times in a row. It's still 50-50 the next toss, whether the 13th toss is going to be heads or tails. So what, like yesterday don't matter. What are you going to do today to reposition? Like if you sold everything and you literally just had cash in the bank, how would you structure your portfolio today? Yeah, I actually have a concrete answer to that. In my real life portfolio, because we don't, I don't have any funds left in our King of the Jungle portfolio, I added a nibble of Tesla mm -hmm. after their earnings, which were quite disappointing and the market did not like at all. I know that this is a company I want to own for the long, long term. And right. at that, at these prices, I don't feel it's stupidly overvalued. It's, I th it's still quite expensive, but therefore I, I only took a, a, a very small buying back in kind of position, but you're right. So that's the mindset I'm in. But when I look at everything else, the only companies that continue to make sense to me are those cheap, uh, you know, the, the kind of dung, dung beetle heap companies that I filled my King of the Jungle portfolio with. And because I already have those, okay. there's no, I mean, this is the, the hard thing. There are almost literally no companies right now that I feel okay buying for valuation reasons. Okay, that's cool. Um... I'm I'm very happy with, let's say, the top 10 companies in my own portfolio and everything I've got in the King of the Jungle Challenge, maybe apart from BYD. Um, I think even though most of those companies are objectively at a rich valuation, I think they're going to do just great over the five to 10 year time frame. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm th there's this uh, unresolved for me pickle that things look really, really bad. Why would I buy equities now at this moment after this huge run up and that everything you're saying for the long-term investor is sensible in five years, these companies will be probably worth more unless one of the more doomsday-ish kinds of outcomes happens, but then we've got bigger issues. So keep it simple like that. I mean, this is the ethos of the long-term investor, right? Just 
buy the companies and hold your nose for the next couple of years if bad things happen in the short term. I know that's not the game you're playing. And I probably, I know many of our listeners probably come from the mindset that, you know, the one you're wrangling with right now. You know, it's hard to focus on the long term when you fear what's going to happen over the one to two year time frame or the six months time frame. It, for me, it's easy. Like, I just ignore it. But it's easy to say it's hard to do. One of the primary rules of investing is only invest with money you could afford to lose. So that's another that if you miss that principle, then you'll be checking your portfolio way too often and there's too much writing on it. You also mentioned something really useful, sunk cost fallacy. To get myself right again, I cannot think in terms of whatever happened up to today. The market does not care about what my portfolio is. What should it be? And maybe that's how I'll resolve this quandary. Which I think, in a way, t t does uh, me buying back Tesla, how's that sound to you as a strategy? Yeah, that's good. I, like, I think it's, as of the results a few days ago, it's uh, certainly uh, available at that value point. And I think they might struggle um, over the next couple of years, but five years plus time frame, I've got no concerns about them. It's in my high conviction stocks list. Yeah, so anyway, it's nice to have one... <laughs> one of the world's best companies among uh among the shit show that is coherent <laughs> the only thing that, that scares me is uh the moment you start going long that's when your the thought short thesis plays out and then the world does collapse so maybe i'll kind yeah, of you to stay short. yeah 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 <laughs> yeah sorry badger <laughs> all right should we make this a bit more tangible and check in with our king of the jungle portfolios, which is our, if you if you haven't caught an older episode, is our investing game. Um, real money, we've got about, how much money we've got in there now? About $1,200, $1,300 of our own money. Uh, we're adding 100 bucks a month, so we're going to add another 100 bucks in two days' time. Um, and we're just trying to buy stocks and see who's got the biggest number after the one-year point. So who's winning right now? Uh, you are a badger. <laughs> yes, sir. May I have another? <laughs> you're not only winning, you're you're totally spanking me. I mean, th this could not have been a more binary outcome at this point. You invested in world-class companies. They have shot straight up with the market anticipating rate cuts. I filled my portfolio with small cap stocks that I thought were severely undervalued. Uh, uh, and some puts betting against uh, regional banks and against Bank of America. Mm -hmm. And both my, my short, m most of my small caps have not done well. They have not risen with the market. And the puts against the market have obviously become less valuable. So we're, we're heading in two very separate directions at this point. What did I do recently, you ask? Yeah. <clears throat> I doubled down. Well, no. <clears throat> the first thing I did, sadly, is I sold my position in the air because the results that came in were really underwhelming and surprising to a large extent to me. My bet, my investment thesis with air was that it's a company that's going to be riding the tailcoats of the electric vehicle revolution, they, they help ensure that silicon carbide chips are properly made to keep it and short. This is, uh, when you say air, this is air test systems, ticker AEHR? Correct. Correct. And also, it's a bet on data warehouses, big AI conglomerates needing more chips that will use silicon carbide based material and photonics. But essentially, the company... Uh, reported earnings that were guiding to much reduced revenue because their big customers are saying uh, we're no longer as certain about these EV orders coming in. So that was a real surprise to me and the market because it was also highly valued company in terms of valuation multiples uh, dropped 20%. So I sold around $17 a share. And here's where, a uh, side note, some of the short-term chart stuff that I use that long-term investors pretty much ignore, the charts 
showed me that the likelihood of the price dropping even further was was high. And so instead of thinking, okay, now that's fallen a lot, let me add, I sold. And the price has unfortunately continued to drop. So in that sense, the technical analysis saved me some dollars. Great. So I sold air. And with that cash, what did I do? I bought one very expensive leap in KRE, a KRE put. So I essentially doubled down on my bet that regional banks will have a very, very hard time uh, in the coming year. Already, I bought another world-class company, one that one of our seven investing colleagues identified, Anaban. If you go check out Anaban Mahanti on Twitter, he talks at some length about a company called Samsara, ticker IOT, and... uh, IOT, you might remember as being the acronym from, you know, 10 years ago, Internet of Things. They've kind of leaned on that a little bit, but they do just do some really interesting stuff. And now you want to talk valuation. This is probably the least attractive valuation of almost any company in my portfolio, almost certainly anything in my King of the Jungle Challenge. It's an expensive company at uh, over 100 times free cash flow. But I like their technology, like what they're doing. Um, there's some really nice YouTubes that show you some of the applications of their technology. Essentially, what do they do? Um, vehicle telematics, so like cameras in commercial vehicles and passenger vehicles, so you can kind of see what's going on uh, with a lot of smart AI stuff interpreting what the camera is seeing, um, plus a whole ton of sensors and controllers. So essentially, if you've got like a highly distributed workforce, Or maybe you're like an energy company and you've got like mining rigs all over the country. Uh, Samsara's technology helps you monitor and control what's happening across your huge network. They just make it really easy with some super smart mobile first dashboards. So like small businesses, but also ginormous industrials can more efficiently manage their footprint and control their business and be efficient. So that seems like a smart technology that the world needs more of and that leans into my the way I like to invest mm-hmm. find the companies that the world needs more of in the next five to ten years and just kind of hold your nose at the valuation a little bit um, although valuation matters kids you know be careful <laughs> yeah I like that way of investing too especially when it makes you a whole lot of bananas it hasn't <clears> in this <throat> case because Samsara is down so but my portfolio in the King of the Jungle Challenge is being held up really nicely by CrowdStrike and Mercado Libre, which mm-hmm. are also two very big positions in my real money portfolio. So, yeah, feeling pretty happy about that right now. Okay. That said, <laughs> there's another way of making money in the market. <laughs> this one's a little more unusual than most. The current uh, laws in the United States are such that uh, elected officials of uh, the U.S. government are allowed to buy stocks. You might be saying to yourself, well, what's the problem with that, if any? Well, uh, elected officials in the U.S. government often have access to all kinds of information that the layperson may or may not And in most cases, when this situation happens, it is illegal to actively trade on what you would call inside information, for what should be pretty obvious reasons. Uh, And many people do, in fact, go to jail for doing just this. Badger, tell us why. (laughs) Tell tell us... uh, why, how this alternate investing strategy is nonetheless a thing, what it is, despite the potential illegalities. Yeah, and let's let's just double down on that disclaimer, right? Insider trading is illegal. And what does that mean? If you have material non-public information, like maybe you work for Tesla in the investor relations department and you see the results before they get published to the market if you trade or you give that information to somebody else with the intention that they trade on it like you go to jail but it's hard to prove that that happened and hard to prove intent maybe someone just got lucky 
you know, maybe they owned the thing in the first place. But I think it's even more um, difficult a situation when it's like an elected official. And this is, we're going to talk about members of the US Congress. And we're going to talk about one in particular as well, Nancy Pelosi, just because she's become the sort of the figurehead for this, uh, you know, alleged, it's not, it's not, is it insider trading? I don't know, you know, decide for yourself. But she's become the sort of brand of that. But this happens in the UK as well. Now, the US did something smart. They implemented something called the Stocks Act. And Stocks is a nice little acronym that means, breaks down as Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge. And they, the Stocks Act did a bunch of things. It reminded members of Congress that insider trading is illegal and those laws apply to them as well. Um, but it also said, because these are public figures, and not only do they have access to inside information, in many cases, they might be controlling the information. You know, they're making decisions and influencing policy that can literally uh, you know, change the trajectory of many of these big companies. Um, so they have to declare, under the Stocks Act, they have to declare their trades within 45 days of making a trade. And there's a bunch of other uh, sort of ancillary requirements of the Stocks Act, but that's the main one. So this is a thing, sadly, um, and it's hard to track and to prosecute. But why are we talking about it on the podcast today? Because uh, I've run into a couple of tools that aggregate the 45-day disclosures and make it really easy for a retail investor to see what their Congress members are doing, and then maybe to trade with that uh, understanding of what their Congress members are trading to. Shall I give you a couple of examples, though, of where some of this alleged wrongdoing is taking place. Yes, please. So here's I'm three. Probably who I need to throw my rotten bananas at. <laughs> <laughs> and this is both sides of the aisle, by the way. This is uh, Democrats and Republicans across the states. You know, we're all humans, and I guess humans are greedy. And I'm not making any allegations about these individuals, but let's just cite a couple of the examples. So uh, evidently... Back in November, um, Republican James Hill sold $250,000 of Philip Morris, um, which is the parent company of uh, another nicotine product called Zin, Z-Y-N-S. And then subsequent to making that sale, um, uh, he's been instrumental in having uh, this industry highly, high, much more highly regulated. So uh, by getting out of that trade... He's avoided some of the pain uh, of that increasing regulation. Uh, here's another one. Um, Representative Mark Green, who is the chair of the Homeland Security Committee, over the last two years, he's built uh, in his own portfolio one and a half million dollar stake in NGL Energy. Um, and then since then, uh, we've had Russia, Ukraine, the Middle East is in chaos, energy markets are going crazy. Um, and he sold uh, a piece of his um, holding for 136% return. So, you know, Homeland Security, he's probably got a bit of inside track on uh, some of this geopolitical con conflict and clearly uh, clearly benefiting from that. And then maybe just to give you uh, one more example, um, uh, Josh Gottheimer, um, who is evidently one of the most active and successful traders in Congress, and he's, he's been trading volumes of up to $50 million. So these are quite big numbers. Um, he's beating the, mar the market by a significant margin. Uh, he has, he's been trading actively in defense stocks, uh, buying companies like Northrop Grumman back in September. Um, and then his role in Congress, he sits on the House Select Committee on Intelligence. So, you know, he's going to have stuff coming across his desk that's going to give him a lot of insight into what's happening in that community. Yeah, so three examples. Doesn't tell you anything necessarily. You know, maybe these trades were nothing to do with the information they had in their personal lives, but perhaps a little hard to believe that might be the case every time. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it's not great, right? It's not great. And it's, it's actually really not great um, because not only are these individuals potentially, allegedly, having access to inside information and then being able to trade on that, if they, let's say some of these guys owned these companies innocently before, 
well, they've got a conflict of interest that might cause them to make a different governance decision. So, you know, I can't help but think the world is poorer because just, you know, we've created conflicts of interest where they shouldn't exist. In my view, if you're in one of these roles where you either have access to information like this or you can influence policy like this, either you should not be allowed, be allowed to own individual companies or it should be through something called a blind trust where you kind of hand your money over to a third party and they manage your portfolio on your behalf. Yeah, like if you want to take this role in society, which is a difficult job, um, th I think that should be one of the uh, consequences of that. Yeah, I, I, th there's a lot of reasons politically why people are upset about the, you could say, foundations of uh, how government is being run. And this is one of these classic examples where it, it looks like what it looks like might actually be what it is that you don't need a real conspiracy theory kind of mind where they're out to get you. Yeah. This, this, put, this has the, the, the almost obvious makings of people who have a certain kind of advantage structurally, financially, uh, in terms of say power are using it to make themselves more wealthy. It's unfair. You know, many things in life are unfair. So, you know, in some, to some extent, it is what it is. Um, but let's let's make this actionable for Wall Street wildlife listeners, because and I'm going to caveat this by saying I do not do this myself. But if you wanted to track the trades of your elected representatives and potentially kind of trade along with them, well, here's two ways you could do that. So. There's a really nice website that I do use for lots of purposes called Quiver Quantitative, and we'll drop a, a link to them in the show notes. Um, they track a whole ton of things, but one of the macro things they follow are the trades of a number of elected officials. Um, so they aggregate that information for you. And I think they even now have a tool where you can sign up and it will kind of do the, it will do like robo advisor auto trading for you to mirror strategies that you've chosen. Again, I don't recommend this necessarily, but the tool is out there if you want to look at it. And a really nice Twitter account. Let's come back to our friend Nancy Pelosi. If you go check out on Twitter, on X, Nancy Pelosi Stock Tracker, it's an account doing exactly that too. It's actually tracking the trades of a number of uh, members of Congress. But I think doing it with a really interesting intention, because that account is trying to draw attention to cases where there might be wrongdoing, and it's trying to drive a change in policy so that the Stocks Act gets made, you know, even more toothy, perhaps. So, yeah, two sources there. We'll link them in the show notes. If you're interested in following some of this stuff yourself, then go check it out. See how, uh, see how you perform. Yeah, thanks for bringing this to our attention, Badger. Uh, I, like, I like learning about all the ways to make money in the stock market. <laughs> Let's, let's preferably stick to legal ones, though. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you keep me on the right side of that line, please. <laughs> you've led me astray. So you've led me so far astray. At least, at least keep me, keep keep me at, <laughs> out in the jungle, huh? <laughs> I'm no good to you. I'm no good to you. Locked up behind bars. <clears throat> it's it's going to be a tough podcast to record when you're uh, you've got other inmates haranguing you to use the telephone. <laughs> all right so if you like today's podcast why don't you uh click the likes smash the buttons right subscribe so that we we have more incentive to get this good juicy investing wisdom to out to more folks where are you on x you can find me at seven luke hallard um at seven flying platypus and we're also on the instagrams we are at wall street wildlife on the instagrams uh, I, I quite a nice blooper reel i've been having fun on the mountain skiing yesterday beautiful sunny day uh go check out my blooper where my buddy cameron basically mows me down as i'm trying to record an insightful youtube <laughs> short <reel. laughs> magic pure magic uh, we do have a website as well. Go check out wallstreetwildlife.com. Christoph's beavering away, trying to uh, fancy that up. And I guess it's got uh, the latest version of our King of the Jungle tracker on there. So if you want to see how ugly 
the situation is getting and how confident I should be in winning the fancy dress dinner, uh, go check out the website. You know, if nothing else, Badger, we're not boring. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.